Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program, North Creek Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Alexandra Callan from Dallas, Texas. Dr. Callan is an assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and a Deadman Family Scholar in Clinical Care at the UD Southwestern Medical Center. She specializes in musculoskeletal oncology and is a member of the multidisciplinary sarcoma program at UD Southwestern and Children's Health. Dr. Callan earned her medical degree at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, and she completed a residency in orthopedic surgery at the Vanderbilt University and subsequently did an orthopedic oncology fellowship at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. She joined the UD Southwestern faculty in 2017, and Dr. Callan's clinical and research interests include outcomes in orthopedic oncology, limb salvage techniques for osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, metastatic bone disease, and quality of life assessment in musculoskeletal oncology. She has a special interest in teaching residents and medical students. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Alexandra Kellogg from Dallas, Texas. Over to you, Alex. Thank you so much for having me uh, join on this excellent educational program. And I'm excited to spend the next hour with you all uh, talking about uh, one of my passions and, and really how uh, I ended up getting into orthopedic oncology. And uh, we'll be talking about limb salvage surgery and challenges in reconstruction and rehabilitation. So over the next hour, we're gonna hit four objectives. First, you're gonna understand bone sarcomas, their etiology and the epidemiology. You're gonna understand some treatment algorithms for bone sarcomas in kids. We're gonna discuss options for local control surgery or the four A's as I like to teach it. And then we're gonna understand rehabilitation challenges in limb salvage surgery, both based on the location and the reconstructive technique uh, that you select. So I have no disclosures, uh, but I do have some acknowledgements. I would like to thank uh, some of my mentors. Uh, I trained uh, in musculoskeletal oncology at MD Anderson, and uh, I learned so much about patient outcomes, surgical techniques, and uh, treatment of sarcoma uh, from them. And several slides from this talk have been um, borrowed from Dr. Pat Lynn, um, uh, along with uh, mentors, Dr. Valerie Lewis and Dr. Bobby Satcher. So as mentioned, I'm in Dallas, Texas. I get the joy of teaching residents. Uh, this is me in the tie-dye and uh, one of the chief residents on a, a service with me as we're getting ready uh, to perform a limb salvage procedure in a kid with an osteosarcoma. Uh, you can see here is a growing child with a distal femoral endoprosthesis. So I work at three different hospitals. I get the university setting at UT Southwestern. I get the children's population at uh, Children's Medical Center. And then I get to work with our um, unfunded or, or county uh, patients at our county hospital, Parkland. So first we need to set a level playing field. Everyone needs to know what a sarcoma is. And I, I love etymology. So you need to know that sarcomas come from the Greek word sarx, which means flesh. And these are cancers from a mesenchymal cell line and specifically mesenchymal cells arise from or make bone, cartilage, muscle, fat, nerve, and blood vessels. So pictured here, you can see um, an osteosarcoma with a pathologic fracture um, in a skeletally immature child. So I apologize for not having a great source for worldwide data, uh, but in the United States specifically, we see 3,200 new bone sarcomas each year. The bulk of these sarcomas are actually chondrosarcomas, mostly in the adult population. But today's talk, we're gonna be focusing on uh, bone cancers in kids. So there's about a thousand new osteosarcomas each year in the United States and about 300 new Ewing sarcomas each year. So you can see here, again, a skeletally immature tibia uh, where a, a bone sarcoma has undergone neoadjuvant uh, radi excuse me, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then resection. Specifically, as you start to wrap your head around getting a diagnosis of a bony malignancy, you got to think about the location. I always 
uh, teach residents location, 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 that's going to help you get your diagnosis. So specifically in the metaphyseal location, um, osteosarcomas are most commonly found around the knee in the perigeniculate area, next uh, most common around the hip or the pelvis, and then uh, finally third around the shoulder. So um, conversely, our Ewing sarcoma patients, they are more commonly found in the diaphysis of long bones, um, either in the femur, the humerus, uh, or the tibia, but these have a predilection for flat bones. So actually, if we um, really look at incidents, most commonly we see Ewing sarcoma occur around the pelvis, around the scapula, or even in the ribs. So you need to be able to speak <clears throat> about sarcomas and describe x-rays. So the buzzwords that, that we use to talk about an aggressive looking x-ray include things like onion skinning, where you see this aggressive periosteal reaction. You can see that the bone tumor is growing so rapidly that the bone um, or the periosteum isn't having time to respond. So the periosteum gets elevated away from the bone. If the tumor destroys some of that periosteum around the bone, you get this Codman's triangle. Bone sarcomas create an osteoid matrix. You know, when you're looking at a normal x-ray, it should be this faint shaded chalk area with normal cortical um, density. But as we get down into the metaphysis, you can see this osteoid matrix where the tumor is creating more bone, and that is an ominous sign. And then finally, you can uh, describe a sunburst pattern where the bone tumor is creating osteoid away from uh, the surface of the bone and, and creating this pattern of aggressive bone formation uh, that is essentially pathognomonic for a bone sarcoma. In terms of looking at osteosarcomas, most commonly these occur in uh, patients age 10 uh, to 30, though we do see a second incidence in patients in their 60s to 80s, uh, more commonly secondary osteosarcomas. Again, on radiographs, you can describe that tumor with sunburst pan pattern, um, osteoid matrix, onion skidding, or Codman's triangles. Most commonly it's perigeniculate or metaphyseal. Uh, to get the diagnosis, you have to get a biopsy. Um, you always need to uh, get the diagnosis so you can make a treatment plan. And on biopsy, you would see malignant spindle cells with um, new bone formation or malignant osteoid. In order to stage a new bone tumor, you need to get an x-ray of the entire bone, get an MRI of the entire bone, start with a chest x-ray, proceed to a chest CT, and then usually get a whole body bone scan to look for any skip mets. And then um, for a general orthopedist, you just need to understand that the treatment course is chemotherapy first, then surgery. You can assess the effectiveness of the chemotherapy and then more chemotherapy to get the best outcome and survival. In osteosarcomas, there are so many different kinds. The most common is that conventional intramedullary osteosarcoma, but certainly we see um, incidents of par osteal osteosarcoma, a stuck on lesion that's low grade, a periosteal osteosarcoma uh, that arises out of the periosteum, most commonly in the tibia. Telangiectatic osteosarcomas should always be on your differential if you're treating an aneurysmal bone cyst. So again, send pathology specimens for anything that you're biopsying. And then there are some other high-grade surface osteosarcomas, low-grade intramedullary osteosarcomas, some very, very rare small cell osteosarcomas or secondary osteosarcomas that occur as a result of radiation treatment, Paget's disease, um, or uh, other uh, bony tumors. Pathology slides you may be tested on. Again, you need to be looking for this pink woven bone uh, that should not be there. This is that malignant osteoid along with interspersed spindle cells with these big, ugly pleomorphic cell shapes um, and uh, mitotic figures in the nuclei. 
You can see our traditional osteoblastic osteosarcomas. You can see sometimes chondroid or cartilaginous de -differ uh, differentiation. That would be a chondroblastic osteosarcoma. Or sometimes you can even see fibroblastic differentiation. You can see here in this osteosarcoma, there is more evidence of these fibrous looking spindle cells. But again, all forms of osteosarcoma. So in general, um, we're doing pretty good at survival. Um, if you have um, over 90% necrosis, meaning they respond well to chemotherapy, our five-year survival is approaching 75%. Um, to all comers with localized disease, our uh, survival is about 67% at five years. And unfortunately, if you are found to have metastatic disease at time of diagnosis, our overall survival is only 20%. So then in terms of looking at Ewing sarcoma, this is the, uh, this is the odd duckling. This is the black sheep of sarcomas. It still is a little bit of a mystery. It's a small round blue cell sarcoma. Um, again, this is a, usually a sarcoma of children aged 10 to their 30s. Similar pattern on radiographs, but usually more commonly found in diaphyseal or flat bones. Um, the biopsy, you see sheets of small round blue cells. Frequently biopsies can be confusing for infection. So biopsy should be sent for both culture looking for infection and then pathology looking for cancer. Um, in general, Ewing sarcomas are positive for CD99, and they have a, a pathognomonic translocation under FISH studies. Um, looking, it's at the T1122 translocation uh, with the ESW FLY1 translocation. Very similar staging workup, though in Ewing sarcoma, you need to add a bone marrow biopsy. And more commonly, we're utilizing a PET scan um, to look for metastatic disease. The one caveat with Ewing sarcoma is that for local control, you can consider surgery or radiation because this is a radio-responsive tumor. Just a little history, Ewing sarcoma was named after pathologist James Ewing. He was the first chief of pathology at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center in New York City. And uh, he initially called this a diffuse endothelioma of bone um, because he was having a hard time classifying it. And uh, they end up calling him the Cancer Man Ewing on Time Magazine. And, um, and ultimately, he uh, explored utilizing radiation for Ewing sarcoma. Certainly, um, from his initial work, we've come quite a long way, I, identifying, again, uh, CD99 positivity, uh, these small round blue cells, occasionally with homorite rosettes, and then ultimately um, the cytogenetic testing or the fish testing with that uh, T1122 translocation has, has what's come to define Ewing sarcoma. Uh, in case any of you watch basketball, I teach my residents to remember the translocation for Ewing sarcoma with Patrick Ewing. Um, number 33 basketball player. So 11 plus 22 equals 33. And hopefully that's a little picture mnemonic for you to remember that translocation. Specifically, um, prior to the addition of chemotherapy uh, with the Ewing sarcoma treatment, there was previously only an 8% survival utilizing just radiation or surgery. And now with uh, modern chemotherapy regimens, we've um, improved survival at five years to up to 70%. Usually Ewing sarcomas uh, show remarkable response to chemotherapy. You can see here the pre-treatment MRI, there's this large soft tissue mass surrounding a femur in the uh, anterior compartment. After 12 weeks of chemotherapy, you can see that soft tissue component is uh, remarkably smaller with only this small area of tumor remaining. Ewing sarcoma causes me the most anxiety for surgical resection because really you can plan your resection based on the post-chemo MRI, uh, but certainly I'm quite nervous every uh, surgical resection about where the tumor was previously touching all of that vastus intermedius. So um, it, it does cause some um, 
some stress and uh, and planning, looking at uh, chemo response uh, to to Ewing in Ewing sarcoma. The other thing that parents frequently ask is, should my child undergo surgery or should should they get radiation? We uh, tend to continue to think that surgery offers better outcomes and improved local control. In this um, study in JBJS in 2003, uh, there did seem to be uh, improved uh, local control or less relapse in the surgery group with only um, 12 percent uh, in patients undergoing surgery versus 41 percent on patients undergoing radiation. Though certainly there is um, still a role for radiation in cases that the tumor is um, unresectable or tumors are very small, uh, though that's outside of the scope of this talk. Because really, I want to get to the exciting part of limb salvage surgery. So bottom line, we've got a baseline groundwork of knowledge. If ever you see an x-ray with an aggressive feature, onion skinning, osteoid matrix, Codman's triangle, sunburst pattern, number one, you should refer them to a specialist or a specialty center that treats bone sarcomas. Number two, you need to get a biopsy. You need to confirm that diagnosis. Staging in general, you need to get an x-ray of the entire bone, an MRI of the entire bone, CAT scan of the chest, because that's the most common place bony sarcomas metastasize, and then you need to look for skip mets or other bony lesions utilizing either a bone scan, scan or a PET CT. In your mind, bone sarcomas, you need to have the algorithm chemo, surgery, chemo, chemo, surgery, chemo. So thankfully, we get most patients started on chemotherapy, uh, make them non-weight bearing, and that gives me time to plan their reconstruction method, whether I have to make a custom implant or get allograft, that gives me some time uh, in the order of about two to three months. Then they take a small break from chemotherapy where I get them to surgery. Um, and then they go back on more chemotherapy. And then I perform surveillance for at least 10 years. So importantly, um, for you and for the patients, you have to remember that the goals of surgery are to remove all the cancer. Um, this is the amazing thing about orthopedic oncology is that I have the opportunity to cure cancer. Certainly, it's not the surgery alone, but we do find that surgery influences outcomes. And a negative margin resection uh, performed by a cancer uh, surgeon is, uh, gives the best chance of of local control and improves overall survival. Certainly the surgery alone isn't enough. We need the chemotherapy on top of that. But the number one goal when I approach a, a, a tumor resection is I've got to remove all the cancer. Secondary goals um, are then to provide the best limb reconstruction possible. And, and so then uh, this is the time that I get to be creative. Uh, certainly, it becomes complicated uh, because tumors are frequently near joints. They're usually abutting neuro critical neurovascular structures, um, and, and, and frequently, uh, these tumors are found in growing kids. So you have to get creative uh, because if we're trying to get these patients to cure, my hope is that they're going to live for another 10, 20, 30, 50 years to have a full, happy, healthy, and productive life. And so um, I'm doing my best to give them a functional limb after we can get them through their battle with cancer. So uh, the way I conceptualize limb salvage or sar sarcoma surgery is I talk about the four A's. Number one, I always bring it up first is amputation. And I do include rotation plasty in this uh, category. Always talk about an amputation because there is a, a strong chance that these children, even if you undergo limb salvage, if they have their sarcoma at age 10, well, in their lifetime, they may end up with an amputation. So I always bring this up first. Um, beyond that, then I start talking about allograft, using cadaver bone to reconstruct an extremity. The third A is arthroplasty or joint replacement utilizing metal. And then finally, uh, the fourth A is allograft prosthetic composite or an APC. And that's where I'm combining techniques utilizing cadaver bone, 
along with um, arthroplasty techniques. So we're gonna go by each of these one by one, um, just so you can get a sense of, of what our options are. In terms of amputation, um, prior to advanced imaging techniques, really in the 80s, the standard of care was amputation. So um, most kids used to get an above knee amputation or a hip disarticulation, depending on where the tumor was located on radiographs. Uh, sometimes if it was in the pelvis, you had to do an external hemipelvectomy, meaning you're taking off the entire leg along with the pelvis. And then um, certainly, we've evolved techniques for rotation plasty, which is pictured here. This is a little six-year-old girl that actually had her entire femur removed and a rotation plasty performed with the tibia being molded into um, a, a pseudo-femoral head and articulating with the acetabulum and the heel ultimately becoming the knee joint for improved uh, prosthetic control and, um, and functional outcomes with the least chance of uh, multiple re revisions throughout her lifetime. You can see here, she's in a spica cast um, and uh, ultimately we uh, may have to play with epiphysiodesis to make sure her leg lengths are um, symmetric as she grows. After amputation, um, uh, here's another example of a hip disarticulation. This was a seven-year-old with an osteosarcoma invo involving his entire femur. You can see here he's walking um, with a, a prosthesis. He's not utilizing any sort of support. And he, um, he is very happy, very functional, has no phantom limb pain. Um, and, and continues to enjoy to dance uh, the moonwalk uh, to Michael Jackson. So after I break the news of, of amputation to families, then, um, then I show them limb salvage options. And really in 1986, uh, some of the giants of uh, orthopedic oncology, uh, both Dr. Simon and Dr. Mankin, um, really looked at survival. And at that point in time, they showed that there was no difference in survival between patients undergoing a limb salvage surgery versus an above knee amputation versus a hip disarticulation. So this really changed the dogma of, uh, of treating bone sarcomas and uh, really forced surgeons uh, to start getting really creative on ways uh, in how we would reconstruct limbs. Um, Additionally, uh, out of MD Anderson, they uh, did look at functional outcomes for uh, patients undergoing both, both limb salvage and amputation. And uh, actually there was no difference. So if ever you are unable to save a limb, if it's encasing neurovascular structures, if the child is too young, if the implant um, it will not fit or cannot be made, uh, well, thankfully uh, there was no significant differences noted in terms of education, employment, medical status, um, and, and health insurance in patients that uh, did have to have an amputation versus limb salvage surgery. So there's literature to support both, um, but I will tell you that the bulk of my patients now, if they have the option, are, are picking limb salvage. Uh, so here um, is an example of an allograft reconstruction. Specifically, this is an osteoarticular allograft reconstruction in a six-year-old male with an osteosarcoma of the distal femur. You can see here, this distal half of the bone is cadaver bone, okay? It has been um, reconstructed with plate and screws along with actually a precise growing nail. There's a magnetic device in here and I'm actually about to lengthen this child um, uh, this, uh, in the next few weeks. Um, you can see here is an intraoperative photo. Here is the allograft distal femur bone. You can see it's been uh, cut and fashioned to uh, match my tumor resection. All of these ethabonds here are used to reconstruct the ACL, the PCL, the um, MCL, the, the L, uh, excuse me, the LCL, the MCL, and I was able to keep the patellar tendon in continuity. Um, and, and then uh, I utilized some demineralized bone matrix at the interface. 
And you can see actually this, uh, he's already showed some really nice uh, osseous integration from his native bone into the cadaver bone. I like this option for some growing children because I don't disrupt the tibial physis. I preserve um, the tibial cartilage. While there is a bit of a mismatch in the size, I'm going to be able to lengthen this child's leg as, as he continues to grow. And then eventually we'll need to be converted into an adult style endoprosthesis um, when the allograft uh, or the native cartilage wears out. All right, third A, arthroplasty. In terms of joint replacements, um, here's some, some primary joint replacements. Uh, as many of you know, in a knee replacement, in a hip replacement, in a shoulder replacement, I'm relying on the patient's native muscle, ligaments, tendon structures to restore function um, as you're uh, removing as little bone as possible. Well, in tumor arthroplasty, uh, we call these things uh, mega joint replacements or mega endoprostheses. Uh, I'm removing large segments of bone and, and then uh, rebuilding them with, uh, uh, without the benefit of, of native tendinous attachments. So you can see here on the left is a large proximal tibia replacement. I've had to remove the uh, proximal fibula. And these are some of the hardest because I'm attaching the patellar tendon down on metal, okay? Not to mention I've uh, had to remove the attachments of the tibialis anterior. Uh, so uh, the recovery in these patients is, is some of the most challenging. Here in a distal femur, again, you lose MCL and LCL, uh, but ultimately you keep the extensor mechanism intact. So uh, rehab for the distal femur megaprosthesis tends to be uh, the most smooth. You can see here is a total humerus endoprosthesis. Again, in a general um, total shoulder replacement, you're relying on the rotator cuff attached to the tuberosities to be able to restore shoulder function. And you can see here that I have to tie down uh, cuff to metal. And then finally, in a proximal femur, again, the entire hip girdle musculature is being attached to a metal prosthesis. And so frequently, we're battling uh, Trendelenburg gait and weakness in hip flexion. Um, so again, the challenges with mega joint replacements are the soft tissue attachments in a, in, in a way to restore function. So, um, the last A, the fourth A, is that APC or the allograft prosthetic composite. Um, here's an example, uh, credit to Dr. Bobby Satcher uh, that I performed with him in uh, fellowship where we uh, performed a total tibia allograft reconstruction for an adamantinoma. Uh, you can see here, we did the allograft of the tibia, a hinged total knee um, with utilizing the cadaver extensor mechanism to tie to the native patella to restore range of motion at the knee. And then we did an ankle fusion. Um, here's a plate and cables to minimize that stress riser. Radiographically, here's what that looks like uh, with the allograft prosthetic knee um, total knee replacement. Again, her native patella that attached to cadaver tendon. And then here is the ankle fusion uh, in order to um, uh, maintain a, a plantar grade foot. All right, so those are the four A's. Now we're gonna go over some of the challenges with rehab. Um, and my physical therapists are very gracious to work with me. Uh, additionally, the physiatrists to try to help come up with plans because almost each of these patients need a personalized rehab protocol. And um, frequently, uh, based on my reconstructive technique, uh, this is going to change based on the age of the child, based on the location of the tumor, and based on how much soft tissue uh, had to be resected with the, the tumor. So frequently, these kids are undergoing prolonged immobilization um, because healing is so slow when they have to get back on chemotherapy to treat their cancer. 
I really focus on trying to keep the limb in a functional position. So I try to avoid flexion contractures at the knee. I utilize uh, many different types of knee braces and casts. And then I really always want the foot to remain plantigrade uh, and avoid an equinus contracture. So I'm utilizing different AFOs and walking boots, um, especially in proximal tibia resections. Um, so we'll uh, go through, again, some of my protocols as I'm rehabbing these patients. Uh, first, a distal femoral endoprosthesis. Usually with a cemented implant, I want these kids to get up and start walking immediately. I uh, usually don't utilize a brace unless I have some concern for a massive quad resection and I, I, I need for some healing of, of my arthrotomy. Um, and then uh, sometimes I'll utilize uh, a knee immobilizer until quad strength and function returns. Proximal tibia is notoriously one of the most difficult to uh, rehab from. Again, I'm trying to get them walking immediately post-operative day one, uh, but I don't let them move their knee for about six weeks because I'm trying to get some uh, integration of that patellar tendon onto a hydroxy type coated metal on the front of the implant. Um, and so I'm frequently using a knee immobilizer in addition to a walker boot. Um, because of, um, of either perineal nerve palsies or a weak uh, tibialis anterior, I, I try to keep that leg in a very functional position and then ultimately get them uh, to a more mobile state as they progress. Uh, you can see here is an intraoperative photo of the extensor mechanism or the patella tendon being tied into this implant through holes Here's a 3D printed metal um, uh, plate on the surface. And then here's some additional clips. Uh, this is actually a Zimmer implant. I always want to get my metal covered completely. So I uh, work frequently with plastic surgeons to do medial um, gastroc rotational flaps. And then you can see some drains left in behind. Here are some of the braces that I would frequently utilize. And then here is a clinical outcome. Uh, this is a child now a year out. Oops, let me try that video again. This is a child who's one year out um, from this proximal tibia resection and reconstruction for an osteosarcoma. And you can see he has excellent motion to the ankle, full extension, no extensor lag, and is able to flex the knee to about 90. Um, and, and so he's uh, very functional, uh, walking and doing light exercise without any assistive devices and cancer free. Um, going on to the proximal femur, these are tricky in growing children. Um, uh, but in general, I also let them be weight bearing as tolerated. This is a child that had a Ewing sarcoma of the proximal tibia, or excuse me, the proximal femur. You can see his triradiate is still open. So he's skeletally immature. There's his open physis down at the distal femur. And he's only 11, so I'm expecting maybe five years left of growth. Uh, after I, I do the tumor resection and reconstruction, I'm tying down the abductors uh, along with the gluteus maximus and the hip flexor, the iliopsoas, onto this metal. There are holes through the implant to tie those down. I utilize a purse string method to repair the capsule, uh, but then ultimately I need all of that to scar in um, so they don't dislocate. So frequently I'm either utilizing a hip abduction brace as pictured here, or sometimes utilizing a knee brace. If you can't flex your knee, it's pretty hard to dislocate your hip, but I give them um, hip dislocation precautions um, uh, until all of those uh, tendons have had a chance to scar in. You can see here specifically is that case, again, an 11 year old male with a Ewing sarcoma. You can see I was able to utilize vastus uh, intermedius and some of vastus lateralis as my soft tissue margin. Here are some of the vessels that are tied off. Here's the implant with all of my muscles tagged, again, utilizing ethabons. I have my abductor complex here, gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, gluteus maximus, and my short external rotators are tagged in the posterior. And then here's iliopsoas tagged anteriorly. And I tie these um, uh, tendons down to the implant. I weave them 
through the holes on the side of the implant. And then there's again, a hydroxy apatite coated um, segment here at the proximal uh, aspect of the body. This clip gets removed. Here is a magnetic device inside. This is a magnetic expandable implant. And again, the stem goes into the femur with again, a hydroxy apatite coated collar and a lateral side plate uh, just to help give it some extra stability. In terms of proximal humerus or total humerus endoprostheses, again, these are notorious for having um, poor shoulder function. Uh, it becomes very difficult to get overhead motion when you're tying rotator cuff uh, back down to metal and or maybe you have had to resect the bulk of the rotator cuff with the tumor. So frequently I make these patients um, non-weight bearing with a sling for approximately six to 12 weeks. I have them start immediately motion to the elbow and the wrist. Um, uh, but then again, I'm trying to get that rotator cuff to scar in and then eventually uh, progress them to passive and then active range of motion. Here's an example of a osteosarcoma in a skeletally mature 13-year-old um, female. You can see uh, there was a, a massive uh, soft tissue component proximally. There's a, the tiny remnant of the glenoid. Uh, there is almost all of the um, deltoid, uh, some of the anterior musculature and cuff being obliterated. And then unfortunately there was tumor that ran all the way down uh, to the olecranon fossa. So the entire humerus had to be resected. You can see here is my endoprosthesis. I'm actually utilizing a, a bovine uh, tissue called surgimend to try to reconstruct the rotator cuff that isn't really there. Um, so I wrap, I tie this into the glenoid uh, to minimize superior escape. And then I get that covered with soft tissue and muscle. You can see here, there's ends up being beautiful anatomy. Here's the radial nerve uh, wrapping around the implant. Um, and then I'm able to utilize uh, remnant soft tissue uh, to cover the entire implant. Again, here's a trabecular coated metal um, cuff that I have uh, locked down to repair pec and deltoid to the implant uh, to offer some, uh, some minimal shoulder function. All right, so I've hit most of the joints. I have a few exceptions when I select reconstructive methods. Um, here, I have uh, what's called a compress implant. Uh, this is trademarked, it's a Biomet implant, um, and it, it offers uh, the most bony preservation. You can get spindles as short as five centimeters, so you're preserving bone, uh, either if the child is very young or if you don't have enough space to get a cemented implant in. The trick with the compress is that you actually need bony healing. You're uh, utilizing Wolf's law of uh, compression to try to get the bone to hypertrophy. So when you first implant this, you're tensioning that at about 800 PSI, pounds per square inch of, of pressure, to stimulate bony healing. Um, onto this hydroxyapatite coated collar. So you can see, um, this is at about three months, there is what we call this elephant um, footprint where the bone has hypertrophied and grown into the metal, making this tiny wimpy little spindle almost irrelevant. Same thing over here, you can see there's a really short segment, but the bone is very thin. So we need to see some um, bony uh, ingrowth. So I will give you a specific case of mine. Again, this is a very active 16 year old male that came to me um, uh, with this very large osteosarcoma. Uh, by the time I met him, I was a second opinion actually. He'd already gone through almost all of his treatment. Luckily he's skeletally uh, mature, um, but he had no Mets. And so I wanted to preserve as much of his healthy bone as possible. So um, I elected for a compress implant. You can see this is one of the short spindles. This is a five centimeter spindle. Um, this is 
at time of, of surgery. He had nice, healthy bone, uh, but I make him touch down weight bearing uh, in hopes of getting some bony ingrowth. Um, and so I see him at the six week visit. I let him uh, progress to weight bearing as tolerated. And unfortunately he gets himself back on the football field playing catch and uh, he sustains this fracture. So the spindle, this compress um, device, you can see uh, the metal completely broke. There hadn't been enough bony ingrowth. Uh, and so uh, this unfortunately uh, required a repeat operation for this child. Uh, you can see I didn't trust him twice, uh, either his bone to ingrow or him to stay off of it. Uh, so I converted this into a cemented stem, distal femoral endoprosthesis. I was able to preserve actually the bulk of the implant, just had to uh, remove that five centimeter segment and, and uh, make that up in metal. You can see this time he's decided to really heal uh, into the implant. And, uh, and here is, uh, is this patient walking uh, now six months out from surgery. Unfortunately, he had very low necrosis and has developed lung mets. So he's about to undergo surgery for those metastases. Um, but uh, he is pain-free with excellent function. And almost, you can't even tell which leg had the surgery aside from the decreased muscle bulk. All right, allograft reconstruction um, certainly has benefits, especially if you're able to save the joints. Uh, the hard part about it is that I don't let these kids walk until I see some evidence of healing, okay? Here is an intercalary allograft. You can see the allograft is here and here. It's filled with some bone cement and fixed with plates and screws, both directions. Um, and again, here is another intercalary allograft fixed with um, an intramedullary rod, a retrograde intramedullary rod and plates and screws. Again, the cuts are here and here, cuts are here and here. Um, and uh, this is great because I'm able to save his native knee joint. I'm able to save his native hip joint along with all of those attachments. Um, but uh, this is dead cadaver bone. So I don't let these patients walk immediately. Um, you can see uh, at 18 months, uh, he has had excellent bony substitution where, where you can see his bone has continued to heal and hypertrophy and make this interface um, on both ends um, much less obvious and much less at a risk for failure. So I actually let this child start ambulating at six months um, and, and now he's, he's essentially free for everything. All right, so we've gone through examples of essentially all four A's. I'm gonna go through a few cases and, and then hopefully save time for some questions here. Um, so I'll, I'll just go in a little more detail here and, and why bone sarcomas in kids are, um, are such a challenge, and, um, but allows for really creative reconstruction options. So um, when I'm thinking about solutions for the growing child, these are kids ages six to 14, um, then one, I try to think of any creative way that I can preserve the physis. So some of those intercalary allografts are some of the ways. Um, I start thinking about timing as to when I maybe need to shut down their good leg or their contralateral physis. Um, sometimes utilizing an osteoarticular allograft, you're able to preserve uh, one good physis and allow uh, normal growth um, for uh, some time. Um, and then most specifically, the most popular option that I'm utilizing now are these growing endoprostheses. For a long time, many companies made these minimally invasive expandable implants where you would go in for a surgery, oh, every three to six months based on the child's growth pattern, um, uh, use some sort of screw device to expand that intraoperatively um, and have the leg keep up with the normal healthy leg. Now, um, Stanmore, uh, out of uh, England, uh, which has actually been bought by Stryker, is a company that makes a non-invasive magnetic expandable implant. And this is an example of one of those such magnetic expandable implants uh, that really allows you to minimize repeat surgeries and maintain 
um, similar leg length uh, as the child grows after they've um, gone through their cancer treatment. Um, I could do almost an entire talk on um, methods for tracking growth and predicting when uh, growth is going to cease and ultimate limb length. Uh, but really, I, I try to use uh, these three principles. Around the knee, there's approximately 15 millimeters of growth per year, nine millimeters from the distal femur, six millimeters from the proximal tibia. And then I estimate that most girls reach skeletal maturity somewhere between ages 12 to 14, and most boys ages 14 to 16. So um, that being said, we won't dwell on that, but I'll show an example here of a nine-year-old that comes in to the emergency room with three months of shin pain. And you can see x-rays immediately give evidence of this aggressive bone tumor. You can see that there is bony destruction, potentially osteoid matrix, um, and, and this periosteal elevation uh, that you can see here specifically is a Codman's triangle. Ultimately, um, uh, with any aggressive bone lesion, we need more information, so we get an MRI. Here you can see in this MRI, the cortex is being destroyed and there's this large soft tissue lesion um, uh, creating periosteal elevation, passing the growth plate, and this is concerning for a bone sarcoma. Biopsy confirms a high-grade osteosarcoma. So again, our algorithm goes right to chemo, surgery, chemo. And then we got to make a plan. So I start thinking about my reconstruction options for an, a nine-year-old male. I'm thinking he has at least seven years of growth remaining. And of the tibia, um, specifically at six millimeters a year, he's going to be short 42 millimeters unless we think of some sort of option. So one... I talk about the four A's, we could amputate, we could do an allograft, we could do the arthroplasty, um, any of these expandable prostheses, or we could do uh, an APC. Ultimately, this child um, and family elected for an expandable endomagnetic endoprosthesis. Again, this is a Stanmore implant. It is custom designed. It takes about eight to 12 weeks to manufacture. And you work with engineers at the, uh, at the company, both to predict growth and to um, fit the child. Things to keep in mind on any of these to fit the magnet, you need at least a 15 centimeter bony resection. And you can see here, we've actually already started growing this child. The cool thing about this Stanmore um, implant, this non-invasive growing prosthesis, is that it's an in-office procedure to lengthen the child. Here is the magnet box. Here, sorry, I gotta get to the next page. Here, this round purple device is the magnet. That sucker is heavy. It weighs about 100 pounds. Um, okay, maybe I'm not that strong. It weighs about 70 pounds. Um, uh, and you connect it to spin the internal magnet device and expand the prosthesis in the office. It grows one millimeter every four minutes. <clears throat> so in general, I do a 20 minute lengthening procedure um, uh, to get a five millimeter lengthening. And you can see as you follow uh, the child with x-rays, this implant's gonna continue to expand. The hope is that I don't completely lose all growth at the distal femoral physis here, uh, but certainly we see evidence over time of uh, decreased uh, growth at the femur. And so there ends up being frequently a joint line mismatch, uh, but certainly this helps uh, save many surgeries for the child um, and, and helps maintain uh, leg length and minimize uh, limp or complications with leg length discrepancy. Here's another example of a skeletally immature child. This is a 10-year-old female who came to the emergency room with a path fracture during dance practice. You can see, here's a great example of this periosteal elevation. Here is the pathologic fracture here and here. This is ominous, the osteoid matrix within the distal um, metadiaphysis of the femur. And then here's some really great examples of onion skinning. Um, and Codman's triangle. 
So she was placed in a cast, um, given uh, a walker, made non-weight bearing and sent to my clinic. Again, I'm working up these bone sarcomas. I need an x-ray of that entire bone, which you didn't see in that initial slide. I get an MRI of the entire femur, chest x-ray, chest CT, whole body bone scan, your basic labs, and I get them over to medical oncology. You can see this 10-year-old female uh, who's an avid ballerina has a, a very unfortunate skip lesion um, or at least tumor involving the entire femur. You can see it runs from the distal femur all the way up to the hip or from the hip all the way down. Um, and, and here's a single MRI slice. And, and so in the past, your really only good option uh, would have been maybe a rotation plasty as uh, met, shown in one of the previous slides in that six-year-old um, or a hip disarticulation. Um, but uh, ultimately with the new technology of these magnetic expandable growing prosthesis, prostheses, her and her family elected for a total femur endoprosthesis. Um, you can see you get um, all of the, the joys of a skeletally immature um, triradiate cartilage in the acetabulum, having to reattach all of the hip girdle muscles to the implant, um, and then again trying to preserve that tibial physis to uh, have some extra growth you can see I don't utilize any cement down the tibial canal, just a little bit on the surface uh, in order to um, help maintain some of the growth of the tibia. You can see though, over time, um, here's before any lengthening. Here is with two rounds of lengthening. Um, there is some uh, excellent evidence of maintenance of the, her leg length. And then also you can see some of the growth. You can see in the era, let me see, how am I doing on time? Woo, eight minutes. Okay, I need a few more seconds before we get to questions. Uh, all right, we've got a nine-year-old male here. This is before the era of uh, magnetic expandable. And this was actually before uh, my tenure at Children's. So I, I met this patient many years after his index surgery. But he was nine and opted for limb salvage surgery. And he had a static total femur replacement placed. Again, you can see the triradiates are open, native patella, cemented implant. So basically the tibial physis has been destroyed um, and the entire femur is replaced with, uh, with metal. So by the time I met him, um, he, um, he was getting along. Somehow he, even despite his uh, metastatic disease, he was in remission and cancer free. Um, but now all of a sudden he's coping with a massive leg length discrepancy, okay? Um, we're uh, struggling with hip subluxation and almost no motion at either hip or knee. Amazingly, he's pain-free, gets around with forearm crutches and continues to go to school and be a very smart, intelligent, um, I, I guess I met him at about age 13, where he still had um, his growth plates open. So the first thing that we do to try to give us any semblance of, um, uh, of symmetry, I shut down his contralateral growth plates. Um, at that time, his hip was still better in socket. Well, as we continued to follow, by the time he hit age 16, um, he was wearing about a 10 inch shoe lift. So almost a 25 centimeter leg length discrepancy. And again, no function. Um, you can see uh, with a CT scan, oh, this should have been a 10 inch leg length discrepancy. It was, it was massive. Um, he was wearing a shoe lift about this big. And uh, you can see uh, there is essentially no normal uh, formed acetabulum. So uh, what do I do for this kid? Um, he actually, I have a, a model here. Uh, I actually was able to utilize a, a model to try to help design a custom implant uh, to restore uh, his, uh, his acetabulum and to start restoring his leg lengths. Uh, we still have a ways to go. I lengthened him at this setting uh, almost uh, six centimeters. His sciatic nerve still works. 
Um, uh, and he has started walking actually without his forearm crutches for the first time ever. And, and so uh, we're certainly making improvements here. Um, I do have two more cases, but I think in the interest of time, um, I, I'm gonna open up the floor for questions. Um, and, um, and thank you. Thank you, Alex. Fantastic lecture. And really excited to see the spectacular work that you're doing at UD Southwestern Dallas. And congratulations for that. And we are very proud to be associated with you. Well, thank you. Yeah. So you can stop sharing, actually. There's okay. a stop sharing button at the bottom. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just a few questions, uh, Alex. I mean, just basic stuff for the interest of residents and fellows. And do you follow the Inneking grading system for decision making? For example, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. For example, if you have a high grade extra compartmental E wings, do you still go for limb salvage or what is your decision making algorithm? Um, in general, I, um, I almost always offer a limb salvage option. There are very few cases where I don't. So um, interestingly, we're trying to move a little bit more to the, Amer the American Cancer uh, Staging System, the AJCC. Um, uh, but the most common answer for any test diagnosis is it's gonna be stage 2B, Enneking or the AJCC. And so basically that, the most common time these are diagnosed are extra compartmental um, and, and localized to, to one bone, but high grade. And so uh, in general, those patients have the best prognosis. They do very well with limb salvage. And, um, and specifically, even if there is a fracture, uh, you can offer limb salvage with equal outcomes. Uh, you know, really it seemed as though, or it continues to be proven true that chemotherapy is the crux of, of overall survival. Um, before we started utilizing chemotherapy, five-year survival, metastatic, non-metastatic was really only about 20%. So what we have come to really believe, no matter if you see metastasis on initial staging, is that there are probably some amount of micrometastases circulating throughout the body, osteosarcoma or Ewing sarcoma, and the chemotherapy is the crux to improving survival. So even if there's a neurovascular bundle involvement, still you, we would still offer limb salvage, isn't it? So um, I've, I've become more and more aggressive, uh, especially with osteosarcomas. As long as the vessels are not encased, then I, I may only get a millimeter margin. I may get the most tiny margin, um, but, but I have had uh, relatively good success at saving the leg. Um, I actually went to the extreme recently of combining a case with a vascular surgeon and a plastic surgeon where we actually removed a segment of the popliteal artery and did a, re a vascular reconstruction um, in order to save this child's leg for a par osteal osteosarcoma. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's a hard recovery. And uh, sadly, on final pathology, they upgraded it to a de-differentiated sarcoma. And so I don't, I don't know, amputation may have been her best option. Um, uh, but I've, I've found that even with very, very uh, minimal uh, margin visible on an MRI, I, I have frequently found a nice uh, soft tissue plane to be able to save that limb. Certainly 100% encased, uh, probably amputation is still gonna be your best bet. And, and that if, if the neurovascular bundle is totally encased, that does negate your ability to do a rotation plasty. So I, even though I put rotation plasty in the amputation category, you have to be able to do a limb salvage surgery, meaning you have to be able to save the entire neurovascular uh, bundle in order to perform that operation. Thank you, Alex, for that. And you mentioned about ne attaining negative margins, right? So intraoperatively, do you have an option of getting a frozen section and to see whether your margins are adequate? Is it negative or positive? I do. I, I, I do send intraoperative frozen margins. Um, and I send a mar I, I make the osteotomy. And so I send a marrow margin first. If anyone out there is a pathologist or, or struggling with marrow margins, ask your pathologist to do a touch prep. 
Um, it's, it's very, very helpful. Um, but I also am giving myself about a two centimeter margin in my bony cut. So I usually um, am very uh, hopeful with an MRI within a couple weeks of surgery after treatment. So they finish neoadjuvant chemo, I get a new surgical planning MRI, and then I, um, I plan at least a two centimeter margin. And, and so um, first I send the marrow margin and then I send soft tissue margins. So I'm sending um, muscle essentially from the areas that I'm most concerned about. Um, and every once in a while, it does change my management. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll be upset at waiting for frozens or be frustrated with their inability to tell me. Uh, but every once in a while, there'll be a suspicious cell and I'll, I'll take more. And, and so I, I do find I continue to use frozen uh, specimens. I also do use a separate setup for reconstruction. So I always have uh, my first table for the tumor resection. As soon as I am happy with my frozen margins, I set the tumor instruments aside. Uh, all surgeons and scrub techs apply new gowns and gloves. We place new drapes over the old drapes, new bovi, new suction. I usually am using a hydrogen peroxide soak as a tumor adjuvant, irrigate with sterile water. Again, these are kind of just voodoo, uh, but they make me feel better. And then completely new instruments for the reconstruction part. Um, so uh, that's great yes. because that's how even uh, some people who do a single stage revision do. Ag agreed. I do the same thing in my single stage infections, treat it like a tumor and you're going to have better success. Great. And just one more question from my side. Uh, see, at one point of time, we all were taught that radiation if you give it for evenings, it melts like snow, isn't it? So do you still give radiation, especially if you have ended up with some positive margins? I know that radiation is not good for the skin and soft tissue. So what is your take on radiation? Um, so in general, it's, it's kind of an either or thing for me. So for radiations, again, the, or for Ewing sarcoma, they're the most stressful surgery because you're right, it usually melts away with chemo. You have this huge soft tissue mass and then it just melts away. That's, that's the nature of these small round blue cells. They're very responsive to chemotherapy. Um, but ultimately with prospective COG, the children's oncology group data, and, and then um, the study back from JBJS, we do think that you have uh, better long-term outcomes, better local control if you can do surgery. So in general, I have the families have multiple discussions um, with me, the medical oncologist, the radiation oncologist that they need to pick. You either pick surgery or you pick radiation in terms of local control. There are certainly times where um, if you have a positive margin, you can add radiation, but that shouldn't be your goal. If you're gonna treat with radiation, do the radiation. If you're gonna treat with surgery, do the surgery um, and, and try not to combine the two. So um, it's in extremities, almost always I'm using um, surgery. Once you start getting into the pelvis, um, it, it becomes a little bit uh, more of a challenge. Uh, sometimes small Ewings around the ankle joint that would be best served probably with an amputation. Frequently uh, radiation is a great option for those people. Um, where a surgery could be very debilitating. And even if it came back, okay, they can deal with a below knee amputation. So, um, so yes, Ewings, you know, they continue to be rare. They continue to cause a lot of angst in me and a fellow orthopedic oncologist as you're thinking about uh, how you're gonna do a surgery and reconstruction. Always my bias is surgery uh, and try to avoid radiation if that's your decision. Thank you, Alex, for that. Uh, Senthil is also in our Zoom room. Senthil is a staff orthopedic surgeon in Dallas. Uh, Senthil, your questions to Alex. Alex, nice presentation and excellent work. You know, like, uh, um, my question is, this is a very complex situation and uh, I have the privilege of working in three different countries. And, uh, you know, there are places where they wouldn't have all the support network and things. So what's your recommendation for somebody who is starting their oncology practice? Do you run the whole care coordination or your medical oncologist take care of it? How does it work? And then... uh, thank you, that's a, that's a great question. I, um, I am very lucky to have uh, great care coordination and great multidisciplinary teams. 
So I, I work very closely with medical oncology. They really probably drive the ship in most of these patients. Uh, so you need to have a great relationship with them because frequently they come to me first. I get the diagnosis, I get the staging workup, but I try to get them into medical oncology as soon as I'm suspicious because they, um, most places, the infrastructure for a cancer center, um, specifically at, at uh, UT Southwestern and at Children's, they have the psychology, they have the child life, um, they have uh, the, the research infrastructure, they have uh, the support network. And so I, I really rely on the cancer center very heavily to help guide my patients through the journey. Uh, that being said, I, I am really involved in my patients' uh, lives in terms of uh, staying with them through surveillance, staying with them, uh, seeing them in the hospital during their chemotherapy, and, um, and, and really working in collaboration with, with the medical oncology team. But I can't do it alone. I attend weekly sarcoma boards for the adult side and the children's side, where I work very, very closely with the radiologists, the pathologists, my interventional radiologists, my radiation oncologists, my physiatrists or my PMNR people, my physical therapists, my nutrition people, uh, my plastic surgeon, my vascular surgeon. I mean, I, I've got these people on speed dial because when I need help, um, I, I need them there for me. And, and so it is, I'm not on an island at all. That makes sense. One last question. Do you, what's your experience with the infection? These are long surgeries. A lot of these patients are immunocompromised. So how often you, you encounter that and when it happens, how catastrophic it is? Yeah. Um, I've been lucky. I'll knock on some wood here. Um, I have not had to um, explant any of my endoprostheses acutely. Um, it gets more complicated when you start working with cadaver bone. I, I've dealt with um, some uh, pretty catastrophic deep infections um, for allografts or APC. So I, I do leave those patients on three months of prophylactic antibiotics. Um, my advice, anytime you're working around the tibia, you got to transfer muscle to cover allograft or metal. Uh, it's just a terrible place for wounds. Skin graft as needed. Um, and, and then certainly, uh, I, I'll be the first to admit wound complications, uh, even superficial ones without deep infections are, um, are a big deal and they happen frequently. I'm trying to get these kids back on chemo about two or three weeks after surgery and we are battling wounds. So, um, as you, interestingly, I have a frequent late, uh, I have probably about a 25 to 30% late wound dehiscence issue in these bone sarcoma kids. They look awesome at two weeks, at three weeks, I clear them for chemotherapy, their wound is healed. Then all of a sudden they go through uh, a cycle of methotrexate uh, or excuse me, of doxorubicin or adromycin cisplatin. They drop all their counts, they become neutropenic and then their wounds open up. At six weeks, the average um, is, is late dehiscence. So then I'm, I'm working with uh, wound care and putting on wound vax or sometimes uh, uh, going in and closing the wounds because the most catastrophic, devastating thing is a deep infection and getting that metal infected. So um, I feel for any of you out there practicing oncology, dealing with infections, it is my albatross. It is, um, it is emotionally exhausting for you and the patient, uh, but know that you're not alone. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any more questions. Thank you very much. It's an excellent presentation, Ken. Dr. Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, uh, for that uh, brilliant presentation. I mean, it's going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. It's, I mean, uh, this kind of presentation we don't have quite often, but exceptional work, Alex. Thank you so much for joining in. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a Bye -bye. good day. Take care.